Greetings and welcome back to T2's Book Club. Today I'm going to be reviewing The Rolling Stones by Robert Heinlein. This was a short book. I read it in about a day. Uh, on the cover it says 95 cents. I guess that's how much books were. Back in 1952 is when this book was uh, published. And you may have heard the term grok that comes from Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. That's uh, that space game where you create your own alien and you can, can kind of you put the different claws and legs and things you make your own. Well, I can't remember the name of it, but that was the name of the aliens, the bad guys in that, because they got it from this uh, science fiction author. But uh, it's got that old old 1950s smell. The pages are yellowed from time. Some of them are starting to come loose. It's really falling apart. The spines and bang Uh If this is interesting on the back of it, there's a blurb that says, uh, it doesn't matter what it says, but it says it's from the New York World-Telegram. So I don't think that even exists anymore. Like usually you see like New York Times recommends this book. This is New York World-Telegram. I don't even know, like, is it a telegram company? So the book is about the family, the last name is Stone, and they end up, they have these two twins, Pastor, or Pollux and Castor, and they're trying to convince their dad to buy a spaceship because they want to go out into space, to like, to uh, Mars and the rings of uh, Jupiter and stuff, <clears throat> and the asteroid belt, and that's like a lot of Robert Hunt and stuff is like, there's this Luna City, which is a city on the moon, there's a Mars kind of a city. Everybody's just kind of just exploring the whole solar system. They don't really go outside the solar system in any Robert Heinlein books, I don't think. But, um, let's see, there's this one story. Uh, I mean, it kind of reminds me of the, if you ever read Quarter Share, Half Share, Full Share, those books. I read the first one of those. It kind of was like that, but more of Robert Heinlein. A lot of humor, a lot of, uh, kind of reminds you of Fallout a little bit, like the way... Like, uh, this was back in the day, man. Uh, their grandma and their father kind of co-write this space play? Or, what was it? Kind of like, have you ever heard, like, uh, you could get these download mods for Fallout 4. It was like Space Patrol, and you could listen to these radio shows. Like, this was back in the day when people would sit around, before TV really was big, and they would, like, read books together. And... They listened to these radio plays and comic books and stuff was really like common place. Like everybody would be reading Archie comics and whatever. And like in the back of this book actually you could order like doubles, like two books in one for like 75 cents. You could have like, I don't know any of these authors. And over here like, I don't know, like Ursula K. Le Guin was on some of these. Uh, oh, Frank Herbert for Doom. His was like a dollar and a quarter. And everybody else was like 60 cents or 95 cents. Because I guess he was big back then. So you would fill it. You would put, you'd put your little address in the thing. And you'd I enclose something plus 10 cents shipping and handling. And you would send it in like the back of a comic book. And they would send you these books. So like, I guess this was what you would do to like you know kill time back in the day in the 50s so yeah in the book they're uh i guess it's kind of like being an actor or whatever they would put on these shows and they would have to be able to communicate with earth on this sh on this like journey they're going to like mars or whatever so like if you leave earth orbit you have to leave at the right time to get the best like take off and slingshot to Mars or whatever it is, the orbit paths have to be certain uh, efficiency. So everybody would go around the same time. So they realize like, are we going to be able to do this play and like be able to communicate with Earth? Like, oh yeah, look behind us. There's like twelve other ships. Like every few miles, there'd be like another ship, and they'd be in contact with them. And at one point, one of them had like an outbreak of a disease, and the mother of the family was a doctor, so she had to go like save them all, and they were in the quarantine. And there's like this whole, like you're trying to buy stuff that's not on other planets and sell it at a higher price when you get there. And they decided like when they went to Mars, they would buy a bunch of bicycles, which they had like rocket propelled bicycles, I guess. Like they made booster bikes or something out of. 
So they were going to like get secondhand ones and fix them up on the way. And the way they did that, they didn't have enough room. So they would chuck them outside and just string them along on a rope outside of their spaceship because they're in zero gravity. And it doesn't really matter like if it's like attached. Or it doesn't matter if it's attached, but if it's like... It doesn't have to be aerodynamic. You can just throw stuff out in the vacuum of space. And it's fine. So one of the ships behind them thought they looked like a Christmas tree and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of weird things like that. Uh, so then, uh, towards the end, they find these things called flat cats on Mars. And then when they went to the asteroid belt with all the miners, they were all lonely. And they ended up having, like, these flat cats were like cats, but they're flat. <laughs> uh, they don't have bones. They're like jelly molds with hair, and they're really cute, and they purr when you hold them and stuff. They make you feel happy. So, I think that's where Star Trek got the Trouble with Tribbles episode. They probably ripped it off of this. Because they multiply and they went crazy and like the whole ship was full of them. And the more you feed them, the more they think the food source is plentiful. So, they multiply. So, you got to like kind of starve them. So, then they had to figure out how we're going to sell all these on Mars. Because if we sell one and the other guy feeds them too much, he's going to have a shitload of them. And it's going to ruin the market. So, we got to sell them all at once. So, they had to put on like this radio show and kind of like get everybody interested at the same time and sell them all. So that's pretty cool. Uh, there's one point where her, their grandma gets stuck because they didn't uh, maintenance their bike correctly or something, and they almost she almost died. But uh, oh, they named it Fuzzy, which is the uh, flat cat. That's a pretty cool name. Um, what else? What else? What else? I mean, it's a pretty good book. It's like all rubber hyena. It's always good. But it's kind of like a different era. You got to read it kind of the way uh, they talked back then. You got to kind of get into that cadence of speech. Everybody talks fast and kind of weird. I like it though. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool how they explain like the different types of spaceships. Like they kind of wanted a more commercial industrial one. And then they realized that they probably weren't very good businessmen so they should get like a cargo or a not a cargo but a uh, passenger one but then uh, they end up getting like a kind of a half and half ah, it's a pretty good book I recommend anything by Robert Heinlein but this is a pretty good one uh, the other one I was going to read called Glory Road it kind of looked like fantasy elements instead of sci-fi so I kind of held off on that and went to the book I'm reading now Austin Grossman's uh, You about game developers so that'll probably be the next one I'll review Hi, I'm back. Uh, I forgot to tell you guys. I was going to read you this excerpt from this page uh, 53 of the Rolling Stones. Uh, I got cold, so I put on a sweater. Um, so one of the things I like about science fiction is they describe things that are normal to us in a way that's really makes it seem weird. Like I was describing a bowl of Raisin Bran in Medieval Times the other day. Kind of like that. And there's a book by John Scalzi, Agent to the Stars. Where they, I, no, was that the one? No, I think it was the Old Man's War. They were talking about describing this alien species with keratinous strands coming out of their head and all these weird things, and you realize they're talking about humans. Because that's what we have. Hair is keratinous strands of... I don't know. So, it's pretty cool. So, in this book, he's talking about... Um, cars, I think. Yeah. He's talking about how spaceships are surprisingly simple machines. They're just basically a rocket engine. <clears throat> now listen to the way he describes uh, a car here. In transportation, the ox cart and the rowboat represent the first stage of technology. The second stage might well be represented by the automobiles of the middle 20th century just before the opening of interplanetary travel. These unbelievable museum pieces were for their time fast, sleek, and powerful, but inside their skins were assembled a preposterous collection of mechanical buffoonery. The prime mover for such a juggernaut might have rested in one's lap. The rest of the mad assembly consisted of afterthoughts intended to correct the uncorrectable to repair the original basic mistake in design, for automobiles and even the early aeroplanes were powered, if one may call it that, by reciprocating engines. A reciprocating engine was a collection of miniature heat engines using, in a basically inefficient cycle, a small percentage of an exothermic chemical reaction, a reaction which was started and stopped every split second. Much of the heat was intentionally thrown away into a water jacket or cooling system, then wasted into the atmosphere through a heat exchanger. 
What little was left caused blocks of metal to thump foolishly back and forth, hence the name reciprocating, and thence through a linkage to cause a shaft and flywheel to spin around. The flywheel, believe it if you can, had no gyroscopic function. It was used to store kinetic energy in a futile attempt to cover up the sins of reciprocation. The shaft, at long last, caused the wheels to turn and thereby propelled this pile of junk over the countryside. The prime mover was used only to accelerate and overcome the friction, a concept then in much wider engineering use. To decelerate, stop, or turn, the heroic human operator used his own muscle power multiplied precariously through a series of levers. Back in the day, you didn't have power steering. You'd actually turn a steering wheel would turn the wheels mechanically. Despite the name automobile, these vehicles had no auto control circuits. Control such as it was, was ex exercised second by second for hours on end by a human being, peering out through a small pane of dirty silica glass and judging unassisted and often disastrously, disastrously his own motion and those of other objects. In almost all cases, the operator had no notion of the kinetic energy stored in his missile and could not have written the basic equation. Newton's laws of motion were to him mysteries as profound as the meanings of the universe. Think about how dumb people are out on the road that drive cars and they're looking through a fucking glass that's dirty with bugs all over it and you can barely see out of it and they don't know anything about physics or how fast they're going it could just plow and somebody kill them. <clears throat> and he goes on, nevertheless millions of these mechanical jokes swarmed over our home planet dodging each other by inches or failing to dodge. None of them ever worked right. By their nature, they could not work right, and they were constantly getting out of order. Their operators were usually mightily pleased when they worked at all. When they did not, which was every few hundred miles, hundred, not hundred thousand, they hired a member of a social class of arcane specialists to make inadequate and always expensive temporary repairs. Despite their mad shortcoming, these automobiles were the most characteristic form of wealth and the most cherished possessions of their time. Three whole generations were slaves to them. That's good writing right there, dude. That's exactly what a car is and how stupid cars are. And we're still on this preposterous fossil fuel engine buffoonery today. 50 years later.